Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. Um, yeah, I just um, I just finished closing a house yesterday, so I'm kind of in an altered mental state right now. But I'll try to. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> told me it's only the beginning of the suffering, so... Yeah, um, yeah anyways, um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the generalization of the Coleman-Mandula theorem. So I, I apologize, it's a bit technical, um, but I think it's an important topic and hopefully of interest um, to lots of people. So let me remind you what the original Coleman-Mandula theorem says, which is that the, well, roughly speaking, and we'll say it a little more precisely later, that the Lie algebra, which I'll somehow write like this, um, of the global symmetry group of any quantum field theory is going to be a direct sum of something which will be um, either the Poincaré or the conformal um, Lie algebra with some internal symmetry. Um, which uh, is a finite dimensional, uh, you know, semi-simple Lie algebra. Uh, well, we're with you once. Um, and, uh, you, know, it's an old, it's a, you know, this goes back to the 60s. You know, there were various failed attempts to try to combine <coughs> Liso spin and Lorenz invariance into some larger symmetry structure, uh, which didn't work. Uh, and Coleman Mandula proved this basically sort of to show that no such attempt could work. Um, and so I, I just want to start by saying so, really, th this is really a statement about the Lie algebra. Um, and so, what I was, what I'm going to do in this talk is try to give you some sense of what the possibilities are if you try to ask for a similar theorem about the groups instead of the Lie algebra. And in particular, this statement says absolutely nothing about discrete symmetries. Um, so you could ask, what are the, you know, what are the possibilities for discrete symmetries to possibly play with Lorenz invariance in some non-trivial way? Um, now you might think that, I, I mean, the pro and I'm going to prove some kind of theorem limiting this. You know, and the problem with no-go theorems is that, you know, since you're saying what can't happen, it's kind of dry sometimes. <coughs> Because you, you can't have an example of something that you're going to prove can't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so let me try to spice things up by first giving an example of what can happen. So that you can at least see that the question is somewhat interesting. So the example is I'm just going to consider um, a free Dirac fermion, massless, four dimensions. Um, and. Uh, I want to talk about two global symmetries, or well, we'll say really one global symmetry of this. So the, the first is chiral symmetry, which says that um, you know it's some some u1 symmetry where if you conjugate phi, uh, then you get e to the i theta gamma phi <coughs> times psi. Okay, chiral symmetry. Um, and then there's also parity. So this is a space-time symmetry. So I'll write the coordinates. And then you get i times gamma 0 times psi of t minus x. Um, and, and you might ask about the i. So the, I, I put the i here so that p squared is 1. Okay, so the, this is here so that p squared is 1. And it, in, in this theory, it's actually it's a choice. So, so sometimes you can talk about the intrinsic parity of the field. So, so this theory has a fermion number symmetry where just all the components rotate. And, and by combining p with fermion number symmetry, I can make this phase be whatever I want, but I've chosen it to be i. OK. Now, the fun thing about this is that um, these two symmetries are actually not commuting with each other. So if you notice that e to the i theta gamma 5 gamma 0 is equal to gamma 0 times e to the minus i theta gamma 5, because gamma 5 and gamma 0 are anti-commuting, um, it means that the, the algebra of these two things is that u of theta times p is equal to p times u of minus theta. And so what this says is that the two fit together um, um, into the group um, O2. 
which is a non-abelian group. So this is an example of a space-time symmetry and an internal symmetry that are not commuting. Okay? So if we're going to try to prove something like the coleman mandula theorem at the level of the groups, we better not prove something too strong, because we have to allow for this kind of thing. <coughs> So, okay, so then what is the sort of general situation, right? I mean, is this kind of all that can happen, or maybe could we have something fancier than this uh, happening? Uh, and that's, so that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, oh, let me add, so, so I, I, last year I wrote this very embarrassingly long paper with Hiroshi Oguri. Uh, I think it was 175 pages. Maybe by NEMA standards it's not long, but for me, for me it's a long <laughs> And, you know, so this is somewhere in the middle of that paper, and then I figured, you know, since no one would ever read it, I, I, should, I should give a talk about it somewhere, just so people are aware of this. Um, okay, but you can look in that paper if you want to see these arguments. Um, okay, so let me start with a definition. Um, uh, I'm going to define global symmetry. And so by now, probably at least some of you have heard me give talks where I define global symmetry several times. Usually I'm, when I do it, I'm talking about internal symmetries. But this time I'm going to do it for space-time symmetries. Because the whole thing is, you know, we're trying to understand the interplay of uh, internal and space-time symmetries. Um, so um, we'll have a, a quantum field theory. Uh, not, not algebraic quantum field theory, but uh, <laughs> quantum field theory um, on um, M on a manifold which is r times sigma. So this is like space and this is time. Um, so I'll say it has um, global symmetry um, g if, uh, then there will be uh, four things that we want to be true. Um, so the first is that um, there exists um, u of g, um, a map from g to the set of unitary and anti-unitary um, operators on, on the Hilbert space, um, uh, w which is a homomorphism, you know, a re representation of, of the symmetry uh, on the Hilbert space. That one, pretty non-controversial. Um, I, I, okay, I didn't write homomorphism, but you know I mean it. Um, okay, then um, I demand that there will also be um, a representation of G um, into the set of conformal isometries of M um, such that so so F G1 composition F G2 is F G1 G2 and then um, if I conjugate, and I'll, I'll define this in a, in a sec. Okay, so I, I so R, here R is a spatial region. A of R is the algebra of operators in that region. And the claim is that if I conjugate the algebra of operators in the region R, um, then what I get is the algebra of operators in the region Fg inverse of R. So, so a space-time symmetry is something where it's allowed to, you know, it, it's allowed to move you around. But if you start with a bunch of operators in this region, then this function f, which you know you could, it could be a translation or a rotation or something, right? It moves the region to somewhere else, and then you're always going to get an operator in that region if you started with an operator in this region. Okay, so, Dan, you're, so you're not. This is only gravity. Uh, this is not gravity. Right? Yeah, yeah, good. So, and, and it's also um, so I'm implicitly here kind of assuming that the um, the energy momentum tensor is not zero. So if you were doing like a topological field theory, then you could have more than conformal isometries. Yeah, and, and, but, and I'm definitely not doing gravity because I'm doing quantum field theory. Yeah. Um, and that has to be onto, or it could, why can't that just go like the trivial? Um, it, it, it could, yeah. So uh, for example, the metric might not have any conformal isometries. Or it could be an internal symmetry. An um, internal symmetry. Inter trivial. Internal symmetries are included here. I'm gonna, that I'm, would be trivial, right? Yeah, that's correct. I'm going to define that there's going to be a subgroup of, the internal symmetries are going to be a subgroup of this. That's right. The subgroup for which f is trivial. I'm going to say that in a minute. Yes. Um, okay. Um, okay, then uh, we need to make sure that we identify the group correctly. So we'll require that for all g, which are not equal to the identity, um, there exists an O of x such that 
this is a local operator, such that u dagger of g, o of x, u of g um, is not equal to o of x. Okay. So if, if we don't require that, then everything is a symmetry. So, so, so it's good to require that. Um, okay. And so finally, um, so I, I haven't said anything about the Hamiltonian or anything yet, right? So, so, so clearly I need to say something about that if we're going to have a symmetry, right? Because symmetry has to, if not commute with the Hamiltonian, at least have some nice algebra with the Hamiltonian. Um, and so what I'll require um, is, is that, um, I'll just say it in words because it's kind of annoying to write it out. Um, I'll say that the stress tensor transforms um, as a conformal tensor um, under um, Fg. So it, <coughs> so it kind of means it's a tensor, except you probably know in conformal field theory, the stress tensor doesn't really transform as a tensor. It transforms as a tensor together with a rescaling. Um, now, let me emphasize that I'm not demanding that this is onto. So for example, um, in the standard model, there's no conformal symmetry. But the Lorenz invariance of, invariance of the standard model is an example of this. It's just that this, um, this map, Fg, just happens to always give us things that are isometries and not just conformal isometries. Yes? What, what, what is it that makes not all unitary matrices be a symmetry? Uh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, the stress ten you know the stress tensor transforming as a conformal tensor is very restrictive. Yeah. There's also there's also this requirement, right? It has to respect the local structure of the theory. So it has to send everything in some region to everything else in some other region, you know, via this transformation, which is a conformal isometry. Um, so what about a scaling transformation in a non conformal theory? Well that's not <coughs> symmetry, right? Well, but what's wrong which one does it? This not? one. Well, the stress tensor scales. If I just do like global scaling, not conformal transformation, but global oh, rescalings, um, even in a non. No, no, no. Because um, because if you have like say you, for example, say you have couplings that have units in them, right? Then those this will be a tensor if you also transform the couplings, but those are background fields, right? So a symmetry is something where the background fields don't transform. So like yeah, just changing your units is not a symmetry, right? Uh, because it changes the background fields. Wait, so a spontaneously broken global yeah. symmetry is not a global symmetry? Um, yeah, so that's a little bit subtle. So there's some fine print that I didn't include here. Um, but actually, in w once all the fine print is included, it is. Because I haven't said anything about the ground state. Everything here is algebraic. Right. So, uh, so, so you need another condition to exist. But I want to allow them. You want to allow them? Yeah, yeah. So in, in, our, pap I mean our, in our paper, we did a million things. And the main thing was, we were trying to rule out global symmetries in quantum gravity, and our argument included spontaneously broken uh, global symmetries. So we wanted to include those in the definitions. But you have to be a little bit subtle about this U in the case where it's spontaneously broken. You know, sometimes people say it doesn't exist. There's a sense in which it does exist, which we are careful to set up, but uh, I'm trying to suppress that. So you have to worry about super selection sectors, I guess. Yeah, that's the thing you have to worry about. Yeah. Sigma is comp so space time is R times sigma? Yeah. In R, I should think of R as time? R is time, yeah. And sigma is compact or not? Um, I'd rather have it not be compact. I, I, I mean, for this talk, let's just have it be R3. I think this talk is just going to happen in Minkowski space. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, in, in the paper, we did sigma because we wanted to do ADS-CFT, so we wanted to allow this to be a sphere. But I, I'm not doing ADS-CFT in this talk, so let's just be in Minkowski space. Yeah, any other questions? OK. Um, Okay, so uh, so in particular, like just to make this a little more concrete, right? Um, if you if you act on an, on the set of local operators with this u, so like if you take u dagger of g, o i of x, <coughs> u of g, where o i of x is some basis for the set of local operators, then you'll have some transformation law, d i j, of g and x, um, o j of f g inverse of x. And so that, that kind of follows from this, but this is maybe just making it a little bit more concrete. Um, and I, this inverse is annoying, but yeah, you, you all know about the inverse, it's there. Um, okay. Um,
And then these d's obey some multiplication law, which maybe I'll write um, here. Uh, I lost my, oh, here it is. Um, d i j of g1, comma x, d j k of g2, f g inverse of x um, equals d i k of g1, g2, x. Um, so you can think of this D as kind of an infinite dimensional representation of the symmetry, uh, where this X is kind of also an index of the matrix, if you like. Um, okay. Um, so that's definition number one. Um, um, so as Matt was asking, let me also give definition number two. Um, so, so given such a <laughs> symmetry, we can define um, uh, its internal subgroup. Internal... Um, G I <coughs> contained in G, um, which is just uh, those G in G such that F G um, is the identity map on M. So the internal symmetries are just the ones that don't move anything around. And that makes sense. Um, we can also define it, if you like, um, as the kernel of F, where F is viewed as a homomorphism. And the kernel of a homomorphism is always a closed normal subgroup. Uh, so uh, this GI will be a closed normal subgroup of G. It's important. It'll be later important What's later. Closed? That it's, yeah. What is closed? Yeah. What is closed? Topologically closed. Oh, topologically. It's a Lie group. Oh. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, um, the question that I want to address today um, is whether or not T is too strong. Or, sorry, number four is too strong. So, because in particular, what it means is that um, somehow the transformation of T mu nu is determined entirely by this FG and not by any of the global, you know, any of the internal parts of the symmetry. So, for example, <coughs> for, any, for anything in GI, right, since F is trivial, it means that T has to be invariant. Uh, and so, in particular, that means that any um, anything in the internal subgroup has to commute with boosts, rotations, translations, dilatations, special conformal transformations. Okay. Um, whereas somehow, what Coleman, Coleman Mandula somehow didn't assume that and instead excluded that by, by proving a theorem. Okay? So, what I'm going to do, so this is the definition we gave, and I think it's the right one, but actually in this talk, I'm not going to use condition four, and I'm just going to work with the first three and then kind of show that condition four is kind of what you have to get. Now, <clears throat> there's kind of an embarrassing thing, which is that um, I'm going to, in doing the argument, I'm going to assume the Coleman-Mandula theorem. And the Coleman-Mandula theorem is actually a theorem about S matrices. It's not really a theorem about quantum field theories. Um, and I don't actually know, in, like for example, an argument that in general quantum field theories, the Coleman-Mandula theorem is correct. I don't know any counterexamples, and I kind of, it's kind of hard to think of what you would do to get a counterexample to the Coleman-Mandula theorem. But since I don't know what the most general assumptions are for the Coleman-Mandula theorem, I'm just going to assume that the Coleman-Mandula theorem is true. So under whatever assumptions the Coleman-Mandula theorem is true in the most generality, my theorem will also be true. <laughs> okay. So sorry, but what can I do? All right. Now, before I get to stating and proving my theorem, we're going to have to do a group theory timeout. Um, and remember some stuff about group theory, or learn some stuff <laughs> okay, so let me tell you, I guess, uh, three basic facts about <coughs> Lie groups. Um, so the first is that, um, so up to isomorphism, um, every Lie algebra, um, G tilde, or actually, well, yeah, okay, I don't know. There's a, yeah, let me call it G tilde, um, is um, the Lie algebra. So this is like every abstract Lie algebra 
um, just to find us a Lie algebra. Is the Lie algebra of a unique um, connected, connected um, simply connected um, Lie group? G, okay. Um, and moreover, um, actually, let me call it G tilde. Um, so in this talk, G tilde will always mean this will always be simply connected when I put it on top of the group. Um, and so, and then, and then, moreover, um, any other Lie group G with this with uh, this Lie algebra. Um, is isomorphic to G tilde mod gamma, where gamma is discrete and central. Okay, so that's kind of long to say, but it's just saying that um, every, every Lie group with a given Lie algebra is always a discrete central quotient of some unique, simply connected, uh, connected Lie group. So if you, don't, if, you, if you don't know it already, now you do. Although it's actually not totally easy to prove. Um, so you don't need to assume that G itself is connected. Which? Oh, no, I do, I do, I do. Sorry, I absolutely do. Yes, connected. Yes. Um, OK, so that, that's fact number one. Um, and if you tell us what part of this is supposed to be non-trivial? What part of this is supposed to be non-trivial? Well, for example, one thing you have to prove is that um, like, every. Why can't I just exponentiate all the generators? Like the usual naive thing. Well, but you can do that. Where, where's the, yeah, where's for, the for, for matrix groups, you can do that. Uh -huh. But not all Lie groups are matrix groups. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Uh, and for example, you have to know that every abstract Lie algebra has a faithful finite dimensional representation. That's called Ado's theorem. And that's a hard theorem. I think. Yeah. Um, okay. So. Uh, okay, another fact that you should know. Um, every compact Lie group G um, has a faithful uh, finite dimensional um, unitary uh, representation. Um, also not obvious. Uh, we actually review the proof of this in the appendix of our paper. Um, it's kind of a nice proof. Um, and then finally, okay, and I'm sorry for this, but if I just pull these out in the middle of giving the argument, I feel like the pedagogy is not good, so I want to give them all in the front. Um, finally, um, if G um, is a, a disconnected Lie group, um, let's see how I want to write this. Um, uh, G naught is its identity component, um, and um, G n is any component. <coughs> this is the last one, I promise. Um, uh, with G naught is we're sorry with with G an element of G naught and h an element of gn, uh, then um, g inverse hg is in gn. Um, and if h prime is also in gn, then um, <laughs> there exists, ser seriously the last thing, um, a g in g naught such that um, h equals g tilde h prime. Okay, so these two are actually easy to prove. So this one says, so this says that with, uh, within any c connected component of a Lie group, you can always get from one element to another by multiplying by something that's in the identity component. Okay, uh, that's, what, that's what the second thing says. The first thing says that if you conjugate by something that's in the identity component, then you stay within the same component. So both of those things are basically obvious by continuity. Okay, all right, so, uh, that's it for the group theory uh, lesson. Um, so 
let's now think about see what how to what this says about the Poincaré and conformal symmetry. So the conformal group, um, and since we're talking about groups, we have to be careful. I'm going to define as O spin of d comma two. So this is a disconnected Lie group that includes reflections, spatial and temporal. Uh, and by writing spin, I mean it also includes fermion parity as a non-trivial element. Um, so this is a disconnected but simply connected group. Okay, that's my definition of the conformal group. Um, the Poincaré symmetry, Poincaré um, is the semi-direct product of um, Rd, which are the translations, with um, with O spin uh, d minus one comma one, and where again the O means I've included parity and time reversal, and spin means I've included fermion parity as a non-trivial element. Okay. Um, so these are both disconnected Lie groups, <coughs> and the point related to this is that. Um, the conformal group, if we take its identity component, is spin of d2. And if we take the identity component of the Poincaré group, um, then that's rd semi-direct product uh, spin of d minus 1 comma 1. Um, and uh, fermion parity is a discrete central element of this, and also Okay, finally now, having learned all that, what the coleman mandula theorem tells us at, about the... So we're, now I'm going to tell you what the coleman mandula theorem tells us about the identity component of the symmetry group. And what it tells us is that the identity component... So this is, this is coleman mandula in group language. That the identity component of the symmetry group is a product of Rd... Um, I'll just write it for the Poincaré case. Spin d minus 1 comma 1 tensored with, okay, here we go. We take the internal symmetry, we take its zero component, and then we go to its universal cover, um, mod a discrete central subgroup. Okay? That's what the Coleman Mandula theorem tells us. So let me say it again. Um, it, the Coleman Mandela theorem tells us this is the Lie algebra. This is the unique, simply, this is the unique connected, simply connected group with that Lie algebra. And then the actual symmetry group must be a discrete central quotient of it. Okay? Now, to make that, to again bring this down to earth, because again, this is just getting sort of mind numbingly abstract. Um, Think about a theory with two Dirac fermions with equal mass. There's two Dirac fermions with equal mass. Um, there's a U2 global symmetry that um, just rotates the two fermions into each other. But there's an element of U2, um, which is uh, minus one, minus one. OK? Um, but that actually acts on the fermions in exactly the same way as fermion parity. Right? The fermion parity, what it does is it multiplies every fermion by a minus sign. Um, and that means that the product of this element of U2 with fermion parity acts trivially on all the, local oper on all the operators, uh, which means that we should quotient by it in, uh, to, get a, to get a faithful representation of the symmetry. And so in this thing with two Dirac fermions, um, with the same mass, um, G is equal to um, U2 times Poincaré group um, mod Z2, where the mod is like a shared element between the spacetime and the, and the internal group. And so again, that's something that can happen at the level of the groups that kind of somehow allows the internal symmetries and the spacetime symmetries to talk to each other. Um, all right. And I think I just push this up. Push from the side or just uh, Okay. Um, 
But how much time do I have? I'm just curious. Oh, quite a bit. I, I mean, I don't actually need that much more, so I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Wrong answer, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so I, I wanted to find one more thing, and then we can, and then we can do the theorem. Um, so I want, I wanted to find um, a subgroup g hat zero of g zero. So let me remind you, g is the full global symmetry group. G zero is its identity component, um, and now I'm going to define for you this g hat. So what this g hat is, um, is um, it's those g which are in g0 such that um, g is um, in the equivalence class of something in the Poincaré or conformal group and then the identity in the internal symmetry group. We're here, I'm, I'm using this decomposition here from Coleman Mandula. So I'm saying that um, up to the, <coughs> before I do this equivalence, then I just have a product of Poincaré with the internal symmetry. After I do the quotient, there are equivalence classes, but I say that anything where within the class there's something like this, I say it's a member of G0. So this is a way of extracting the Poincaré or conformal group even after you've done the, the, the discrete quotient. Um, uh, and this G0 will always be isomorphic either to um, this CG0 or this, this PG0. Um, or their quotients by fermion parity. All right. Well, so the E is identity in the internal. Yeah, so bubble. E is the identity and the internal symmetry. That's right. Um, OK, so now I can tell you the theorem. Uh, generalized Coleman Mandula. Um, so, OK, again, we have a QFT. There's a global symmetry G. Um, and we assume it's a Lie algebra it contains the Poincaré algebra. Um, so we also we assume so we assume Lorentz invariance. Um, we assume the Coleman Mandula theorem, as I said, because I don't know how to prove the Coleman Mandula theorem as generally as I would like to, but I think it's true. Um, and then I'm also going to assume something that maybe seems a bit more weird. I'm going to assume that GI is compact. I don't really have a great argument that GI should always be compact. Um, I mean, there are examples of quantum <laughs> field theories where it isn't. But uh, somehow, in good examples, or it seems to be compact. Anyways, it's just part, it's an assumption of the theorem. Um, in, in our paper, we were interested in ADS CFT, so then we could say that a global symmetry in the boundary theory was dual to a gauge symmetry in the bulk, and that had to be compact. Um, we, we, we sort of, we did give a CFT, we did give in CFTs, we gave an argument that assuming reasonable things about the operator product expansion, the group has to be compact. But anyways, you may or may not like our reasonable things. Okay, so these are the assumptions. Um, then the theorem, then the theorem, okay, then um, all elements of GI um, commute with all elements of G naught hat. That's the theorem. So it says every internal symmetry has to commute with things that lie within basically the identity component of, of the Poincaré or conformal symmetry. So more prosaically, if you lost track of all the notation, what this says is that every internal symmetry has to commute with boosts, rotations, translations, dilatations, and special conformal transformations if the latter two exist. If they don't, then just the first three. Okay. But they don't have to commute with CP and T or whatever. Yeah, that's right. And we discovered already that they don't. That there are examples where they don't. Yes. Um, I other than the public use example. Yeah. yeah. Um, you can always redefine what you mean by P. Yeah. By combining it with an internal symmetry. 
Yeah, so the I so can the precise statement yeah. you say that P commutes with the internal symmetry is to say that there is no choice of P such that um, so if you say that the yeah, I, don't, I don't think there's good I don't think there will be a choice where it does here. Because the only other and the only other symmetry around here is just fermion number. This is a four dimensional Dirac fermion? Yeah, that's correct. Massless. Yeah. So th they're just one of them. So the, the only other symmetry one are Dirac. So one Dirac. So there's a U1 fermion number symmetry? Yes. Imagine you had just one vial. What would you say they are? Well, I don't know. Then I, I would so put a gamma five, five there. So I guess I'm not sure. The smallest representation is just two components. No, but I can't. Then I wouldn't have this P at all, right? Because I put a gamma zero. Well, there's a question of what you mean by P. There yeah, is there is. There is an operation. And the yeah. transformation laws with the with a Lorentz group like P. Yeah, but okay. So let me say. So we can, without giving names to the symmetries, Good. right? We can just say what is the what is the whole global symmetry group. So the whole global, the internal global symmetry group here. Well, sorry, not not internal because I'm including in P, including P. But there's a there's O2 times U1, um, where this is where this is a, a fermion number. So this is the symmetry that commutes with the Lorentz group. Um, the set of all operations. Well, that P with doesn't the commute with the Lorentz group, right? There's a subset that commutes with the Lorentz. Group. Oh, but that yeah, but that's not this. So this the the one that commutes with the Lorentz group is uh, u1 times u1, I guess. Why isn't it u2? By the way, you have two fermions. No, one fermion. One Dirac, but you could view it as two bytes. Oh. Um, yeah, you're right. I probably could. Yeah. That's right. Okay, so I would have yeah. said that the global symmetry that commutes to the Lorentz group is definitely U2. Um, they have two vials, and then I can try and add something that does not commute to the Lorentz group. And I might be confused and combine it with one of these elements in U2. Well, why, why don't you see what I say at the end? Because I'm going to say what I think the most general situation is. And I, I'm not going to say that there's a unique choice of P. There's not. You can always combine it with something else. But the point here was that P might not commute with the internal symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it looks like to me. But that's kind of easy because even if you had a P that commutes, you can always define a P prime that does not commute. By fact, taking any element of the internal symmetry, combine it with a P that commutes and form something that does not commute. Yeah, but I'm not sure. I don't know that I can be removed here, can it? Um, I believe the answer is yes. Yeah, well, I mean, certainly the, what I did here was, cor so so the, let's see, so you want, you want to do something where I, uh, but P has to switch the two wild fermions. That's non-negotiable, right? Yeah. Well, that's your P. No. Yeah. No. Well, I don't, yeah, I mean, the, 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 there's maybe a bit of a semantic thing No, it's here, not a semantic. Yeah. There is the set of all transformations you could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The yeah, so the, I mean, I think this then G internal is the thing you're talking there, about. There's a subgroup that commutes yeah. with the Lorentz group. The Lorentz group is well defined. There's a subgroup that commutes with the Lorentz group. That's what's normally called the internal symmetry. Then you try to define P, C, T. So C is an internal symmetry. But when you say the Lorentz group, you mean the identity component, right? The identity component. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Now we try to add the others. Yeah. And there's an ambiguity in how you parameterize it. And you can have all sorts of results, surprising results, if you make choices. So this is not my idea. This is explained not in this language, but there's a counterpart of that in Weinberg's book. Yeah, yeah. And Weinberg has a whole collection of ADAs. Yeah, freedom yeah. in how you define all these things. But yeah, this and I is an use, ADA. I think we discussed it at lunch today. Yeah, yeah. And you have freedom in using these ADAs. Yeah. And you use the freedom to achieve various things that you would like. So the question, the, a meaningful statement would be, there is no choice of ADAs such that something happens. Because it's yeah. easy to find choices well, of ADAs. Well, so I think the thing happen. I was trying to obtain here, which you may object to, is that I wanted, um, the eta to be the same for the whole Dirac spinner, which maybe you don't like. I actually don't like that. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. Why? Yeah, no, I mean, well, I, I just uh, made a choice. No, I agree, I just made a and choice. And if you view the Dirac fermion as two vial fermions, will eta be the same or not for the two, the two fermions? 
Um, I, there may be different by a complex conjugate. I have to think well, about that, it. No, but that's the whole point. Yeah, I think the second one is the complex conjugate of the first because I wanted the direct to come out with just this i. Well, but you are not going to have this problem if you didn't make this choice. Uh -huh. So if you choose each other, it commutes with the u2, uh -huh. then you don't have this problem. That's why I insisted that it's u2. Yeah. I think you did not use all the internal symmetries. Of the no, that's true. I didn't. That's true. That's definitely true. And and by using these extra symmetries, you might remove this surprising result of yours. Well, I have to think about it. I might also be able to add things that break the symmetry down to what I said. So, uh, yeah, I, mean, I don't see why I shouldn't be able to do that. I think it would be easy, actually, to do that. And then I could have an example where you can't say this. You don't think so? Or I have to play with it. I don't know. Um, OK. Anyway, let me, let, let, let's get back to where we were. Um, so uh, let me see. Um, Okay, so what we want to show is that we want to show that uh, um, any element, any internal symmetry commutes with any element of the identity component of the, of the Lorentz group or a quadformal group. Um, so here's the idea. So say that H is in GI um, and also that H is in some connected component of G, which I'll call GN. Um, okay. So, uh, since by a, uh, and then also say and also say that G is in G not hat. Okay, we're going to try and show that H and G are commuting. Um, so, we first note that G inverse <coughs> HG. What is GN? Uh, GN, it just, uh, it, I just gave a name. It's component of G. It can be any component. Oh, I just oh. have to give a name to the connected component which G is sitting inside of. Um, so, okay, then um, clearly this G, so, so, so this, since this guy is in the identity component, uh, so if it's, in the, if it's in this G hat, G0 hat, G0 hat is also in G0, so it's in the identity component, so this has to also be in GN. So I, I took something in this component, I contracted, I conjugated by something in the identity component, I still have something in the same component as before. Um, and in particular, that means that G inverse HG has to be equal to some <coughs> tilde H of G times H, um, where G tilde H of G is in G naught. Um, so this is this uh, property C up here. Okay, uh, so then our, our goal is to show that this is the identity, is to show that G tilde H of G is equal to the identity for all H and G, because if we show that, right, then if this is 1, then I can just move this over here, and this is saying H and G commute. Um, now, since GI is a normal subgroup, so GI normal um, implies that G tilde H of G has to be also in GI because um, this is the conjugate of something which is internal. Since it's a normal subgroup, this is also internal. This is internal, so I can move it over here and I'm left with something internal. So this G tilde has to be an internal symmetry. Um, and it, since it's also in G0, it means it has to be in the intersection of GI and G0. Um, and that means that by the coleman mandula theorem, that um, G tilde H of G commutes um, with G. Okay. Now, the claim is going to be that that implies that this G tilde H gives um, a homomorphism of the whole group into um, GI. So the claim um, is that G tilde H is a homomorphism from G naught H into GI. And to check that, you have to show that G tilde H of G1, um, G tilde H of G2 um, is equal to 
G tilde H of G1, G2. Um, and you can actually show that. So this, um, using the definition, is H, um, sorry, is G2 inverse H, G2 H inverse. Um, G2 has to commute with this, so this is equal to G2 inverse G tilde H of G1 H G2 H inverse. Um, this is G1 inverse H G1 times H inverse. These cancel, and then we indeed just get this. Okay. So this is a homomorphism. I'm sorry this is getting, this is very mathy. I somehow can't, can't be avoided. Um, and then finally, um, since GI is compact, um, by assumption two, um, there exists a faithful finite dimensional unitary representation. Um, let's call it rho. Uh, and therefore, rho composed with um, G tilde H is a unitary finite dimensional rep representation of G hat naught. Um, okay, but now we're actually done because um, this is either the Poincare or the conformal group, and the only finite dimensional unitary representations of the Poincare and the conformal group are trivial. Um, so, moreover, since this row is faithful, it means that this has to be the identity everywhere, and that's what we wanted to show. Okay, so that was some group theory. Okay, so that is a proof that all global symmetries have to compute with commute with boosts, rotations, translations, uh, dilatations, and special conformal transformations, uh, which presumably is why we never found a theory where they did it. Um, now, um, I guess that's basically what I was going to say. Then I was going to make a small comment about how we're supposed to think about the things that aren't in the identity component, like P and T. So, well, I have to think again about this example, but still I think that probably you can have cases where things that you call space-time symmetries don't commute with internal symmetries. Um, but the thing that, the formal thing that you can say is that any element of the group is going to be equal to something g hat, which is just in the identity component of the Poincaré group, times something h, where this h, um, uh, its associated f h, is always either the identity, a spatial reflection, a time reflection, or a product of the two. Okay. Um, and then what I can't rule out is that this h acts on g i as a non-trivial outer automorphism, which in the example that we just talked about, so that's saying if I take <coughs> h inverse g i h, um, I don't necessarily get back just g i with nothing happened. I might get it up to some reshufflings. And so for example, in the example I talked about in the beginning, we had that p r of theta p was equal to r of minus theta. And, and that can happen, yeah. I don't, now, yeah, Nati seems to think that there's some reshuffling that you can do to legisl, you know, sort of relabel it away. I'm not sure, I didn't think so, but I'll think about it again. Um, but certainly, I mean, this is allowed, and, and that, that is an example of this. Whether we can always get rid of it, I'll think again. I don't know, I tried before, but I didn't try that hard. Um, okay, but anyway, the theorem is definitely true. So, so no internal symmetries that don't commute with boost translations, rotations, dilatations, and special conformal transformations. Okay, thanks. Any questions from anyone other than Nati? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind questions from Nati. Well, I wanted to give others an opportunity. Take it away. <laughs> oh, 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 there we go. Okay, thanks, Andy. Um, how do large... Uh, uh, U1 gauge symmetries fit into this story. Yeah, so those aren't global symmetries in my accounting. So they are? They are not. And so for example, Hiroshi and I proved a theorem that there are no global symmetries in the bulk. 
And had our theorem included the possibility of a U1 long range gauge transformation, our theorem would have been wrong, right? Because those certainly exist and they're global symmetries in the dual CFD. I, I understand that, but where are they ruled out here? Uh, number three. Because there are no local operators that are charged under them. Sure, there are. Sure, there are. No. The things that are charged under them are attached to infinity by a Wilson line. There are no, there are no local operators in electrodynamics that are charged under U1 gauge symmetry. For example, the gauge symmetry is just generated by the flux of infinity, and it's space-like separated from the center, right? So it has to commute with anything in the center. I don't think that's right. You don't think that's right? No. Okay. Well, okay, give me an more, example. Let's distinguish. Well, let's just you, talk you about QED. That electromagnetism. Wait, is it is the global U1 charge? Is that considered a phase rotation? Is that what's that? That's not a global symmetry. Oh, that's not a global. That's symmetry. what we call we called that a long range gauge symmetry in our paper. Oh, okay. So and that's not, if that's not a global symmetry, then that no, it's not. So the okay, but it's an interesting. The statement of ADS CFT is that. A global symmetry in the boundary theory is dual to a long-range gauge symmetry in the bulk. And, and there are no global symmetries in the bulk. OK. Yeah. But wait, so it's but just, just condition three. But uh, so you're saying there's no operators which carry charge? Well, there are, but there, there are no local operators. You can have operators which are addressed to infinity by some Wilson line or Coulomb there no dressing or something. There are no local charged. operators that are charged. And that's just a fundamental distinction between global symmetries and gauge symmetries. I see. But gauge symmetries divide into uh, interesting ones like and redundant ones. Non-trivial ones. Yeah, that, that's correct. So the our long-range gauge symmetries are physical. So one of the things, yeah, so th there's this lore that in ADS-CFT, a global symmetry in the boundary is dual to a gauge symmetry in the bulk. But that kind of, that clearly couldn't be quite right, right? Because because gauge symmetry can just be a redundancy of description. So yeah. what, what a global symmetry in the boundary is dual to, it has to be something physical. And so it's this thing we call a long-range gauge symmetry. I see. And that's something that you can define just totally gauge invariantly. You never have to talk about the fields. You know, it's fixed right, under duality. Right, right, right. Um, so it's that, but you just cross out three, or um, no, no. But then you have to you have to add more rules now because if you if you just cross out three and don't do anything else, then the monster group is the symmetry of the standard model. Um, <laughs> no, so you you have to include the Wilson lines. You don't need. Additional assumptions that give you no theory. So uh, no. O is not all physically interesting operators. It's just <laughs> the local ones. Yeah, so O is the it local doesn't ones. Include the O doesn't include the operator that creates an electron. No, it does not. But then, what if you have a global symmetry which doesn't have a current in the boundary theory, and there's no gauge? Um. Yeah, I don't. I. T so the theories. The I tend to think that the. The ones that don't have Noether currents kind of are too weird to have gravity duals. But I just asked if you need additional assumptions even though there's there. But no, I don't. I well, yeah. So no, because well, okay. So this is more about the rest of the paper. But we used um, something called splitability, which we just showed was true on the sphere. So the the counterexamples to Noether's theorem are all related to breakdowns of splitability on manifolds of non-trivial topology. But we didn't need to use non-trivial topology, um, manifolds of non-trivial topology to make our argument. So I think our arguments are true in all CFTs, without having to assume that Noether's theorem is correct. I mean, for one thing, our arguments work for discrete symmetries, too. Yeah? Is there any way to define uh, 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 the standard intuition behind the Coleman Mendel theorem that if you have these, if you have these whole uh, symmetries with extra indices, you can move, move the wave, wave packets around and uh, make the things miss, so the aspect would have to be trivial and so on. Yeah. You would think that if, if, even if you have a discrete symmetry, you would think that that's even more extreme. Would, wouldn't you? Like, yeah. Like so you, it, it's not just that you'd move them gradually, but that have to sort of move 
in big blocks somehow. I mean, it, it, yeah. Uh, I mean, you, I'm you just could. Wondering, is there some? Is there yeah, some I thought about sort of. This more intuitive reason for the whole kind of Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so I, it's kind of funny that uh, that you should you need the weaker one in order to make the stronger one. Yeah. When already the already the standard the standard behind yeah. the, the proof has this very simple. I, I think it's probably more just laziness on my part because. I don't know if any of you tried to study the proof of the kolman mendel theorem, but it's much harder than this. Like this was like the notation was a little bit annoying, but if you think about it for a half an hour, everything is clear. But for kolman mendel it's really there's a lot of annoying details and secret <coughs> assumptions that go in there. And uh, but but you're 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 using it. That's not fair. That's <laughs> 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 sorry, 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 I outsource that. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's, correct. That's correct. What can I say? Yeah, oh, it's it's like proving like things conditional on the Riemann hypothesis, right? You're allowed to do that. Am <laughs> 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 I, mean, I, I thinking about it wrong? That 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 that, that at least the, if there was an if there was that version of the argument, it would be sort of even more obviously true, right? That if you had a if you had a if, if you had a discrete symmetry that didn't commute to the Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic. Like not just gradually move the wave package around, but just check, you know, move it around yeah, a lot, yeah, and okay. just miss by a lot. Yeah, I'm right? sympathetic to that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Why haven't you drawn any pictures? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. You know, I guess because most of the arguments are algebraic. Um, yeah, yeah. If I tried to prove the theorem the way Nima is saying, I probably would have drawn a few more pictures. <laughs> 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 well, the argument would have been a lot longer. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So there, there, isn't, there isn't one picture you can draw that would prove Coleman and Dula? Um, well, for the for the original Coleman Mendula, there's an intuitive picture, which is what he said. Um, but then, if you really try to make it precise, then you get hung up on all these technical issues, and then you have to get into this very messy argument. Um, yeah, I mean, but you know, by the standards of group theory arguments, this one is really not too bad, actually. And I mean, actually, there's a lot of pictures associated to this Lie group things. It's just you know, I don't know. It's uh, time is finite. <coughs> yeah. Okay, let's thank Daniel again.